to have you. You guys doing okay? Doing good? All right. It's like eight people that are awake. Are you guys doing good? Woo! All right, good. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors around here. Good to have you here. Uh, we are doing our last week in the skeptical series. So for some of you, it's like, oh, thank the Lord this is the last week because we've been talking about history and science. And today, we're, this will be the most like philosophical. So we'll have to get our thinking caps on. Make sure you got your coffee and your Red Bull because we got a bunch of stuff to hit. But this will be one of like, if you're not into philosophy, this one for you will be a little tougher. But you know what? You're here and it'd be rude to leave. So uh, glad that you're here. And this is the last week of this series, and we're talking about this big question about whether it's narrow-minded to say that Jesus is the only way, and so we're going to be talking about that. And then uh, next week, we uh, start our series called Unstoppable, and we are preaching through the book of Acts. So we're back in the Bible, uh, super excited. The book of Acts is this amazing book. God shows up, does all these unpredictable things to change the world, and so one of the things that we're saying is join the revolution. That's what the book of Acts was. It was a revolution that changed the world, changed how people live, changed what people believe, and literally changed the world, overthrew the empires of the world. And what if God could do a movement like that again? We could be a part of it. So we're going to just go chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the book of Acts, and it is going to be awesome. So if you've got a Bible, John chapter 14 is where we are, and we bump into what has been called probably the most controversial thing that Christianity claims. And if you're here and a friend brought you and you're exploring Christianity, we're glad you're here. And this is one of those things that bumps up against our cultural uh, narrative and the way that we think as a culture in the 21st century, 2024 in the Western world. Um, and it pushes up against kind of how we think. And so we're gonna have an interaction about what Jesus feels about this issue versus what our culture or maybe some of us in this room feel and see how it susses out. And it all starts from one of the passages where Jesus talks about it in John 14, right at the beginning. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, verse one, do not let your hearts be troubled. I love this because he's, how many of us uh, need Jesus' words around uh, not having troubled hearts, right? Like we live in a world where we're, we're troubled all the time. We have massive levels of anxiety. We know about every war, every murder, everybody who likes us and doesn't like us because we're on social media. We, we have so much information. We are all troubled. Anxiety, mental health, all of the things that we go through in life. There's a troubledness that is undercurrent in our hearts and our minds every single day. And so here's Jesus of Nazareth looking at his disciples, looking at us, looking at you and me and, and saying, do not be troubled but why? What is it about not being troubled? How do we not be troubled? He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. So he does this like, this would have blown the Jewish mind, right? You believe in God, but also believe in me because what I've been telling you for a whole bunch of chapters is now when you use the word God, which you have a very Jewish kind of Unitarian, there's a God and he's distant and he's one. Now I'm telling you, when you use that word, you need to reshape it, redraw it around me. I am actually God who has come down to earth. As, as uh, Eugene Peterson says in the message version of John chapter one, verse 14, where the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus, God showed up in person in the world and he started talking and saying that all the religious ideas out there, Eastern philosophy, uh, Western philosophy, religious ideals about God and salvation and earning favor, he was saying, now you gotta bring me into the conversation. I am God. And, and what are you gonna do with that? And so he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. This is one of the only times Jesus talks about actually his second coming. He does it a few times throughout the gospels. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. I love this because he just throws it out with a little like, he knows the response is gonna be actually we don't, but he just says it anyway. He's like, you know the place where I'm going and he goes to move on. And then they're like, da, 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 da. so Thomas, <laughs> Thomas, of course, the doubter, the doubting Thomas says to him, Lord, actually, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? I want to go to heaven too. 
I want to go to this place with all these rooms. But how do we get there? I don't know the way. And Jesus says, I, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father, here's what it is, except through me. This is the definition of exclusivity. This, these are some terms that we're going to learn as we go here. There's exclusive thought and inclusive thought. Inclusive thought is what our culture believes. All ideas, if atheism says all religion is false, inclusivism says all religions are true. They're all right. They're just different paths to the same God, but let's not sit and argue about it. Let's just allow all religions to be true. And Jesus, of course, says, there's no one who gets to the Father except through me. I am the only way. I'm the, I'm the only path. In Matthew chapter seven, he says, the road is narrow that leads to life and few find it. The road is wide that leads to destruction and most people find it. These these verses are like a hard candy in our culture. It's like putting it in your mouth and you, you crack down on it. You're like, ooh, I don't like how this feels. But we're gonna find out that just not liking how something feels doesn't actually speak to whether it's true or not. And so let's start this way. Uh, McLean's Magazine, which is a Canadian magazine, which I'm sure you all subscribe to, had an article had an article a few years ago, and the title of the article was, How Canadian Are You? And uh, the result was this. It says more than 30% of Canadians were most uncomfortable, like in their life socially, around evangelical Christians. A similar percentage as other top untouchables of society, like drug addicts and child abusers. So... <laughs> So this is what Canadians think about Christians. They think that we're the same as child abusers and drug addicts. And the reason they gave for why they think that is because we are bigoted and narrow-minded, because we say that Jesus is the only way. Ergo, the quote of the magazine says, atheism is wrong, Judaism is wrong, Islam is wrong, Mormonism is wrong, ergo, you are being mean, narrow-minded, and judgmental to other people, so we don't like you. That's the basic premise of inclusivism. They don't like exclusive ideas. Now, when I first became a Christian, this, of course, was very serious. This isn't a hypothetical question for me. I come from a non-Christian family. So when I became a Christian, when I was like 17, 18 years old, all my family, all my friends were, a bunch of my friends were Muslims and Sikhs. All my family and friends were atheists or agnostics. So this was never hypothetical for me. My heart wanted to say, everybody just gets in and everyone goes to heaven. And these are all just different paths to the same thing. And then I started to read Jesus and it started to kind of push against me too. And so we began to realize that, man, is it logical to actually believe this? And the first thing I'll say is inclusivism is this concept that uh, no one has a lock on the truth, right? So atheism says all religions are false. Inclusivism says all religions are true, and they're just different paths to the same place. If you're taking notes, that's the basic definition. Now, uh, to illustrate this in modern terms, how many of you guys have seen Ricky Bobby, the movie? Right? Ricky Bobby, like some of you are embarrassed. You're like, eh, I've seen Ricky Bobby. Okay, so... So Ricky Bobby, Will Ferrell, of course, he's the, the car race, NASCAR driver... And, uh, you, know, you know, when he prays this sweet baby Jesus and all of that stuff in the, in the prayer over dinner. I like my Jesus in diapers. I like my Jesus with a tuxedo t-shirt because I'm serious, but I'm here to party, right? Like that kind of Ricky Bobby stuff. Anyway, so he, uh, he, catches, he, he crashes his car and he thinks he's on fire. And, of course, you know, when you crash in a NASCAR and you're on fire, you can't see it, so it's invisible. So he's running around the track. And I would show you the clip, but some of you might stumble because he's in his underwear there, his white gitch. And he's running around. And, and what is his prayer in order to get out of this scenario? He says, help me, Allah. And then he says, help me, Jewish God. Now, there's not two gods who would hate each other more than those two, but okay. And then he says, help me, Tom Cruise. Use your witchcraft on me. And then he says, help me, Oprah Winifrey, right? 
And in that moment, Ricky Bobby is doing what our culture does. It's called hedging your bets. What you're saying is rather than saying, if I, if I really bank on this God, that means all of this is false. Rather than doing that, I'm just gonna say that all the gods could be a possibility and I'll hedge my bets and throw my, you know, my, my prayers and whatever to them and hopefully one of them will save me. That's the whole idea. So, a couple of modern examples of this. Rabbi Shmuley Boteik in one of his books says this. I am absolutely against any religion that says one faith is superior to another. I don't see how that is anything different than spiritual racism. Mahatma Gandhi says, my position is that all great religions are fundamentally equal. Theologian Oprah Winfrey says, (laughs) one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe that there's only one way. Actually, there are many diverse paths leading to God. So how do we respond to this? I'm gonna blaze through this as much as I can. Hopefully you can take some things out of it. Um, First, is we all have to recognize that this is more of a repulsion than a logical argument for why it's not true, right? So it's actually very similar to the question of hell. When you sit down and you read the teachings of Jesus on hell, it's not that they don't make sense and that they're logical, which is what this whole series is about, because if you're here and you're skeptical, oftentimes you say Christians aren't logical people, they don't follow the evidence. And this whole series is saying, no, it's actually the evidence that we're trying to follow, because on the basis of logic, Hell makes actually a lot of sense. It's just that you don't like it. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't feel good. It's more of a repulsion than actually a legitimate logical thing that you push against. It's like, it doesn't feel good to fire people, for instance, but it might be the right thing to do, right? It's, it never feels good to punish your kids or, or ground them. You know, I got three daughters, 17, 15, and 13. And if it was up to me, these kids would be grounded all the time, all right? But my wife has, you know, shown me the path of greater parenting. But anyway, so every time my kids do something wrong, I'm just like, well, that's a week. That's just a week right there. And Aaron's like, no, we don't ground our kids. We therapeutically talk about self-esteem. I'm like, ah! So it is. So, so, so I used to get grounded as, as a kid all the time, right? Like I, I would, I mean, I got grounded one time. I snuck out the window and wouldn't hung out with my friends while I was grounded, but by the time I got back, my parents had locked the window. So they were having a party. I had to ring the doorbell and go into the party like, hey, what's up? So that was another week. That's 80s, baby. That's the way to go. It doesn't feel good, though, because if I look at my 15-year-old kids, they're going, no, daddy, you don't even understand reality anymore. You're old. My kids ask me how it was like to grow up in the olden days. I'm like, it was 1985, man. Like, what are you talking about? Um, But so it doesn't feel good. But just because something doesn't feel good doesn't mean it's not true. So be very careful when you reject Christianity based on repulsion because what you might be doing, it's very important, you might actually just be a product of the cultural moment that you happen to be in right now. You might just be reading the teleprompter of what the culture is saying to you in the city that you happen to live in, in the year you happen to be alive. And if you reject Jesus, who is the timeless one over your cultural 2024 and how people think and what they prioritize, you might be fooling yourself away from truth based on a feeling, based on a culture moment. So um, here's where some of this begins to contradict itself. Pure inclusivism says we have to embrace all ideas. So I was golfing. This is a totally true story, okay? This is not like a preacher's story, like Kevin Thompson's story, okay? This is like, <laughs> okay, this is, this, is a real, this is a real story. This actually happened, okay? I'm golfing with this guy a few years ago, and I had known him a little bit. We talked. So we're golfing, we're turning the ninth hole, whatever we're on, and, I, and we start to talk about faith and religion. And he says, well, what do you believe? I said, well, Jesus is the only way. He says, see, this is what I can't deal with. You're narrow-minded, you're bigoted. This is why all the wars happen. This is why all the violence happens. You can't actually believe that. I said, what are you talking about? Let's talk about this. What do you mean? And I said, well, what do you believe? He said, well, all, all the religions are true. All of them are right. Don't be arguing about this. This is what's wrong with society today. And I said, okay, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm an accountant. I said, okay, so you deal with math. Yes. I said, okay, let's say your daughter, who was in grade five or something at the time, went and did a, a math test, and she said, you know, two plus two 
equals five at the beginning of the test. And she brought it home and said, Daddy, what is two plus two? And he said, well, it's four. But I feel like it's five. I said, what would you do? And realizing where it was going to go, he said, I would allow her to believe it was five if that's what she wanted to believe. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. That was a real conversation. At which point I'm like, you're, you're the worst accountant I've ever met in my life. <laughs> because sooner or later, you have to bump up against what's called reality. And that math is built into the universe. These are laws that are already there. Two plus two will always equal four, always. It doesn't matter what you feel about it. And so when it comes to this question, we have to be very careful that we're not just talking about how you feel, but what reality actually is, okay? So that's point number one. Point number two is we gotta understand that inclusivism really does come from good intentions. Right? We live in a multicultural society. We live in a, a pluralistic society where there are people from all different religions, all different cultures, all of that, that become part of our world. And we should be the people, as Jesus talks about, that actually fights for what's called cultural pluralism. We need to be the people who actually go, we actually live in a culture where we're not going to expect you to be a Christian, right? Like we're not going to make America a theocracy where it's illegal not to be a Christian. We believe in this coming of the, the kingdom of God on earth as is in heaven. We're not gonna be like, okay, we have to legislate Christianity where you have to be a Christian or you go to jail or something like that. And so in the same way, we actually fight for people that we might disagree with. So, so here's what happened to me. When I was almost done college, I was in my fourth year of college. I was uh, in an academic uh, pathway. I was doing a bunch of New Testament studies, Greek and all this stuff. Last year, a couple months left, and the guidance counselor calls me down to her office and says to me, no joke, we've, we've dug up your, your uh, academic report, and we've realized that you are two credits short of your high school diploma. And I'm like, okay, I'm almost done college. She's like, and this, this sounds like the premise of a John Hughes movie. She goes, you're going back to high school. <laughs> and I, as a 24-year-old man, went back to high school for the summer. I walk in with my backpack. All these kids are 17 years old, right? I'm like, hey, guys, how you doing, right? I walked into the class, no joke, and they assigned like this essay. And so I've written a hundred essays and read 200 books by now. And so they assign this thing. I'm, you know, I'm just pumping this thing. I have footnotes. I always, you know, this guy, epistemologically this and homiletically, hermeneutical, sociological experiments of Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule with the eschatological. So <laughs> these students are like, I like doggy walk up Wall Street tree cat. So I get, I get, the teacher figures it out pretty quick because <laughs> he's like handing all these essays back. He's like, D, D, D. And he's like, we talk later. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm Doogie Hauser. I'm just brilliant. Why, what do you mean? Got this big beard. So anyways, he talks to me later. He's like, what's the deal? I'm like, I'm, out, yeah, I'm, I'm almost done college. So we would talk and I would like defend Christianity and he would constantly bash Christianity I would talk about. Anyway, one day I came in late to school and this girl, Muslim girl, who I'd become friends with over the course of these few weeks to talk about Jesus, she comes running out of the classroom and she's bawling. And I said, what's going on? And she said, the teacher is completely bashing Islam. He's bashing me. He's saying, I don't know anything about the Quran. I don't know anything about the five pillars. I don't know anything. And she's bawling. And in that moment, I went into the room and started defending the Muslim girl to the teacher because that's the Christian way. The Christian way is born out of, we live in a cultural pluralism where we need to fight for people that we don't agree with, right? Like, like but this is where we've lost it as a culture. We don't understand the concept of, I can love, walk with, be with you, and not agree with you at the same time. We think, if I don't agree with your ideas, I don't love you. 
And that's where the Christian is called to actually love people for cultural renewal. Even if the people might not necessarily agree with you, it's the general shalom of the world. And you might have to work with a Marxist or a Mormon or a Catholic or whatever. And you're doing these things. That's cultural pluralism. But that's different than what philosophers call metaphysical pluralism, which is I not only agree that I, you need to have the right to believe what you believe, you're right in believing it. And that's what we wouldn't agree with. That's what Jesus wouldn't agree with. It's not saying you're right. It's just saying you have the right to believe it. So metaphysical or the question of God pluralism is all beliefs about God are true. Well, that's not true. I mean, my wife and I, I love it. So, okay, so there's an objective answer to the question of what, what is the greatest movie of all time, right? There's actually an answer to that. There's three options. There's Shawshank Redemption, Godfather 1, Godfather 2. That's it, right? There's no, there's no conversation about this that's legitimate outside of those three movies. So, but my wife thinks it's some Hallmark movie where the you know, guy in the plaid acts, you know, he redeems the girl from the New York exec office because she comes back to her hometown and she thinks that is the greatest film of all time. And I'm saying, guys, 13 going on 30 is pretty good movie, but it's not the greatest movie of all time. Now, this doesn't mean we're gonna get a divorce. It just means she's objectively wrong. Right? So this is what we're talking about as a culture. I can disagree with, you can actually be wrong about something, but I still love you. I'm still with you. I still walk with you. And this is the difference we have as a culture. So picture this. When I first become a believer, I start reading the Bible. My best friend at the time was a Wiccan witch. Legitimately, she would do spells. We were quite the, we were quite the scene because out in front of our high school, I'd be like, you know, I'd be like reading the Bible, right? Smoking a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> like, people be like, what do you believe? I believe Jesus is the only way. What do you believe, right? <laughs> and she'd be sitting there dressed in full black garb, black makeup, and they go, what do you believe? She oh, we're going to Summerland, and we're doing spells, and we're going out in the forest tonight, and all this. And we, now here's the crazy thing. We would constantly argue with each other about history and philosophy and religion. The one thing neither of us would have said is that we were both right. It's worth the fight to actually go, let's not abandon the search for truth just so we can get along. Right? We've got to go after truth because that's going to be the most loving thing. So, Tim Keller talks about the idea. He was, a, he was a pastor, one of my favorite writers and thinkers and pastors in the world, passed away about a year or so ago. He planted a church in New York City, Manhattan, the most progressive thinking place in the world, all the great media outlets and, and universities, all that in Manhattan. So he's a pastor and he would get invited to go on university campuses and talk about religion. And one day he got up there and there was a Muslim, what's called an imam, a Muslim pastor, uh, a Jewish rabbi, and him as a Christian minister. And they all were talking on the stage at this university. I think it was Columbia University. And he says this in his book, uh, The Reason for God. He says, we all agreed on the statement, if Christians are right about Jesus being God, the Muslims and Jews fail in a serious way to love God as God really is. But if Muslims and Jews are right that Jesus is not God, but rather a teacher or a prophet, then Christians fail in a serious way to love God as God really is. And then he says, several of the students seemed quite disturbed by this because to insist that one faith has a better grasp on truth than others was seen as intolerant. That's the tension that we live in as a culture. The, the actual religions themselves are all in agreement because they are, again for your notes, exclusivist in their very beliefs. And here's the thing, if you are a real, true inclusivist, the problem is, is it's a contradiction. Because if you want to include all ideas, here's who you end up excluding, all the exclusivists. And ergo, you become an exclusivist because you disagree with the exclusivist view on things. Some of you are like, what? <laughs> here's the example. So I'm working at Michael's Arts and Crafts store, 
That's not a joke. That's just me telling you what I'm the setting for the situation, all right? So I'm working on Michael's Arts and Crafts store. I got my red apron on. I'm making 6 20 an hour. I'm putting away some Christmas wreaths because it's July in Michael's. That's what you do. And me and this other university student, he's hardcore against Christianity, hardcore against God. And he says, don't you know, Mark, to believe in truth, is, it's, it's mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's what people do when they want power. Because this is what Foucault and Freud and all these people, this is what they said, right? Is that anybody who says there's truth, they're the people in power and they want to control you through power. And so any truth claim is a power play by a culture. And that's why postmodern philosophy and existentialism said there's no such thing as truth because it's easier to do way, easier to do way power. Now the problem with that is, is the minute you say there's no such thing as truth, you are now taking the power play because you become the most powerful because you're saying, oh, there's no such thing as truth. And people are like, well, okay, that's a power play. It, so Freud said, there's no, any statement you make on God or religion, it's just your self-projection coming out of guilt and insecurity. To which I would say, well, Mr. Freud, you just made a statement about God and religion that's only coming out of your insecurity and guilt, so why should I listen to you? So this guy at Michael's says there's no such thing as truth. And I said, do you believe that statement to be true? And he said, yes, wait, ooh. Because the minute you want to say that there's no such thing as truth, the one thing you have to get people to believe in is that that's true. And it all begins to fall apart. And we begin to see when Jesus says, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life that he's doing something that's more logical than anything we tend to believe. Because when you start looking at religions, they all contradict each other. And so the law of non-contradiction says not, two things cannot be true at the same time if they are opposite in the same way. And so if I was to say to you, um, okay, so let's, let's do it this way. So there's a group of people, this is totally real, there's a group of people today, you can look this up later when you get home, that believe that birds aren't real. Have you heard of these people? They don't believe birds are real. They believe, oh, there, there, many of them, they believe, there's actually a basket, a guy who's being recruited for basketball right now, he had, a, he had a, a press conference like last week or something, he's being like recruited by all the top college teams, and someone asked him about some question, and he went off on this, and everyone's sitting there, he's like, there's no birds. Everyone's like, what the? And he, <laughs> the birds all disappeared in like the 40s and 50s, and now the birds that are out there are government sent spies and the reason that they go and sit on wires is to recharge, all right? This is a real, this is a real idea. Now, now let's just, let's just realize some of this for a second. So if your buddy, if you're sitting around over coffee and he goes, there's no birds, ha, ah, that's funny, Tommy. What do you mean? Well, they're sent there by spies and they recharge on the wires, ha. Ah. You're joking, right, Tommy? No, there's no birds. That's all fine. Unless Tommy says, and I'm taking all my money and I'm banking it on this. I'm taking my whole life, my soul, my metaphysical questions, my family, and we're all gonna build our life on this idea. In that moment, it goes from being playful to being like, no, 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 Tommy, don't, 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 don't do this. Because the truth is actually more important than how Tommy or whatever I call them feels in that moment. That it's worth the conversation when it starts to become about the most important thing. Like, I don't know, the question of God, your soul, meaning, morality, eternity, the afterlife. We can't just, listen, here's we can't just try to get through Thanksgiving dinner without a fight. If your uncle is sitting around the Thanksgiving dinner and goes, you know, guys, there's no birds. You'd be like, Uncle, what are you talking? Like, you don't just go, yeah, cool, pass the gravy. You ask some follow-up questions because having a conversation about truth is worth the conflict. And we're a culture that doesn't like conflict. I mean, I'm Canadian. We're the most non-conflict. We don't even have an army. We're just like, hey, if North Korea goes nuts, America, please help us out. All right, yes, then. You can just come to the border. We just give you the country. Here, take it. I don't know. You just... <laughs> because
because we don't love conflict, so we don't dive into truth. We don't like having the discussion, but we have to. In reality, we have to challenge. So I was, I was trying to think, like, so um, this is a little bit ago. We were having a barbecue at my house, and I'm not like the guy who goes to the grocery store very often. I get a little confused in there. I usually end up FaceTiming, like, what kind of barbecue sauce or whatever I'm getting. There's 95 ketchups. I don't know what you want, and I always get it wrong. So, but this was pretty early in our marriage, and Aaron said, look, I got to do a couple things. So we're going to have a barbecue. We have a bunch of people over. We're going to have hamburgers. Over. I need you to go to the grocery store. I need you to get a couple tomatoes and some lettuce so we can put it on these burgers. And I'm like, okay, fine. So I go to the grocery store. I walk in. I get some tomatoes. I get some lettuce. I bring them home, and I'm chopping up the tomatoes, and I'm pulling apart the lettuce, and I put it in a bowl, and she walks down, and she looks, and she's like, what is that? And I'm like, what do you mean? That's tomato. We're getting, we're good to go. She's like, that's a red pepper, bro. <laughs> and I'm like, what? what? Then she looks over and goes, and what is that? Like, it's lettuce. She goes, that is a cabbage. <laughs> I went and bought a red pepper and a cabbage. Now, in that moment, all of my guests have an option. They're either not going to offend me Right? They're going to either challenge me or just like, oh, this is a great red pepper. Great job, Mark. And keep me living in complete blindness to reality. And that's what we've decided to do as a culture. Instead of challenging ideas. Because here's what we've got to understand. You know when people say, people say this to me all the time. Mark, don't you understand? All religions are just the same group of ideas. Right? All religions are the same. And I would say... I would agree with that, except that they disagree on um, God, salvation, humankind, origins, meaning, morality, destiny, heaven, hell, the afterlife, the soul. Except for those things, they all agree. <laughs> they contradict each other at every single level. And two things that are opposites cannot be true at the same time and in the same way. And when we begin, here's my challenge, when we begin to take a pure inclusivist version of reality, we are such a product of middle class suburban culture. Because you went to college for one year and you read half a book on Kierkegaard and you sit around with your Starbucks lattes saying, you know what I think, John? I think we should just say all religions are equal. Oh yes, John, this is such a great, idea. we're so smart, all religions, everybody's the same. Everybody goes to heaven when they die. Don't you know that it's, you know, the four blind men, I've had this thrown at me so many times, the, floor, or the four blind men and they're holding different parts of the elephant. Have you ever heard this metaphor? And they're blind, and so one guy's got the tail, and one guy's got the trunk, and one guy's got the ear, and one guy's, and, the, and then someone says, well, what are you holding? And they say, I'm holding a hose, I'm holding a piece of paper, I'm holding a tree. And religion is just that. It's everybody blind, holding on to something. And as Alvin Plantinga pointed out as a, ph a philosopher, he said, the problem with that metaphor is it's being told from the view of someone who can see. And you're saying nobody has a comprehensive vision of reality but the whole metaphor is being told by someone who has a comprehensive vision of reality. And I'm assuming that's now you. And so, for those of you, hey, John, all religions, we're all going to heaven. Here's what I would ask you to do. Jump on a plane tonight and fly to Israel. And walk around the streets of Israel right now and look at a Jew and say, you know those people you're fighting across the border in Palestine? Don't worry we're all going to heaven together. And then walk across the border to those Palestinians as the bombs are dropping all around them. And then say, hey, Palestinians, don't worry about this fight. Because all those Jews, we're all going to heaven one day. It's going to be a party. What do you all think? It's actually the most offensive position of all because it excludes anybody who says, no, no, God says this is the way. Not all the ways, but this is the way. So what is Jesus saying then? It's not intolerant. It's the most loving thing he can say. If you're caught in a cave and there's only one way out of that cave and I tell you, don't try the other paths. It's just this path. Is that intolerant? Or loving. 
This is what Jesus Christ is doing to every single one of us. He's saying, whatever you think all these different paths are, you are caught in a cave. And the only way out of sin, the only way out of of your insecurity, the only way out of the shame and the guilt that you feel even in this moment is to understand that I I'm the only way. And so people say, well, you only, you only, I had a guy look at me recently and he said, you only became a Christian because you're Canadian. It's because you live in the Western world. If you were born in Morocco, you'd probably be a Muslim. And I said, you know, really good point. But the only reason you're an inclusivist is because you were born in Canada. If you were born in Morocco, you probably wouldn't be an inclusivist. And he goes, hey, me. Jesus comes to us and he says, if you want life, because this whole idea that all religions, we got to understand that there are some ideas that are better than other ideas, right? When you say all religions are true, which ones? The Ammonite religions that used to take babies and throw them into the fire as a sacrifice where they beat a drum so you couldn't hear them screaming. How about that one? Well, that one's pretty rough. I don't know about that one. What about Jim Jones? When he gathered a whole bunch of people down in Guyana and made them drink suicide uh, liquid, so 900 people died. What about that religion? Should we say that one's okay? Well, no, no, that's a little barbaric. Okay, so which ones then? The ones that are, 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 are middle class and the ones that you already like? Be careful when you want to say this idea is true only because you're comfortable with it. That's the most dangerous place to be. Because if God really exists, I'm just throwing this out, he might disagree with you once in a while about what you want to do with your sex life, about what you want to do with your money, about what you think about salvation. He might push back once in a while and say, actually, if you read the scriptures, I have different ideas about all of this. Okay, so let's land this with one of the last points that people have said to me many times, which is Christianity, the only reason you believe in it, Mark, is because it's a crutch. It's what weak people believe in because they're afraid to die. You know, most philosophy and religion is born out of the question of our own death. And so the only reason you believe in Christianity is because you're weak. And I would say, man, that's, when I became a Christian at 17, 18 years old, it wasn't because I was weak. It's because I literally, I wasn't weak. I was a seven, how many 17 year olds are like, I'm just so self-aware of my own weakness right now. I just, I need so many things. I was a 17 year old pompous. If you walked up to me and said, how are you? I'm good, man. The world is in front of me. I got stuff, things are happening. Things are good. I wouldn't say it's for the weak. I would say it's people that are pining after truth, not what's comfortable. Because if it's for the weak, how do you say that to the 100 million Christians that have died by martyrdom in the last 2,000 years? 100 million people have died because they said, I believe in Jesus. That's not some weak little, that's life and death for truth. It's actually the inclusivist, the pluralist that takes the most comfortable position of all because you're never gonna have to offend anybody. We chase these things down because they're true. So I'll end with this. There was a, I've been a pastor for a lot of years and I get to get up and I have this very interesting job where I get to look out at all of you every week. And I can see you all sit in the same basic seats. Right, you got these rhythms. So I know, you know, these people are here when I'm, when I'm, you know, not sure about an idea, I'll just look over and there's encouragement and smiles. They don't know what I'm saying, but they're, they're in, they're, they're excited about me and they support me. And then I'll look over here and it's like, I'm ready to go. When are we leaving here? Not you, sir. You are crossing your arms right now, but I wasn't actually imitating you. (laughs) But I start to learn you a little bit. Every Sunday as we go through these rhythms, and it's cool. But there's a downside to that as a pastor because I remember a bunch of years ago, a girl, a woman named Carrie started coming to our church and she was sitting in the same seat and she came to know Jesus and I baptized her. At 40 years old, I did her wedding and she already had a couple kids from a previous marriage and they got married and then six months later, she got a cancer diagnosis and six months after that, I'm in the hospital with her as she, all her weight goes away and her, hands become these bony hands and I used to watch her watch me preach and I used to watch her worship and I used to watch her greet 
and now she's passing away. And I looked her right in the face and I said, Carrie, are you scared? And she legitimately, without missing a beat, right in her eyes, looked. she said, I don't fear at all because Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he went and prepared a place for me and I'm going there now. See, this is the difference between Christianity. It's not some moral construct. It's not ideas that get you to heaven one day. That's religion. It's that no matter what you did, you could never earn it. So heaven in Jesus came down the ladder to save you. And that that historically actually happened. It's not like an eightfold path to this and a five. It's, it's this actually took place. And when you do face your death, there's no fear in it anymore. Not because it's a good idea, but because it's true. That's the difference. She didn't fear death. Not, that's not why she became a Christian. It was the fruit of her becoming one because she followed the truth. And when I started studying Christianity, I started looking at Luke and he names all these geographies and all these islands and all these people and all these leaders. And there's museums that go, it's crazy. But in the 162 times the gospel writer Luke mentions all of these things in Luke and Acts, every single one of them is accurate. No one can say, all of these things are the reason I am the way, the truth and the life. I don't want you to abandon truth for the sake of civility and tolerance. I want you to go after it because it's the most loving thing for you and everyone around you. That's the whole point of Jesus laying this out for us. So let's pray. God, I do pray in this moment. We live in a culture where it is sometimes difficult to believe in things that by default exclude other things. I pray that your loving teaching on this would grab a hold of our hearts and we would believe it with all of our being. And then we would share it with the people around us. Because if this isn't true, then we have no motivation to ever share you because people are just taking their own path. You've eliminated that as an option. In Acts chapter four, the apostles got up and preached. There's no other name under heaven by which people can be saved. And so even in this moment, maybe there's people that need to, for the first time, give their life to you. That they would just pray and say, Jesus, I receive you in this moment as the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for dying for my sin and rising again for my salvation that I might go to heaven one day. And Jesus, for those of us who've already started to follow you, that this would get into our bones, that you are the only way. And the most loving thing we can do is tell the world around us how to get out of that cave and follow the only way versus their own way, which is probably the hardest thing for us to do. Do that among us as a church. In Jesus' good name we pray, amen. Hey guys, Pastor Mark here, one of the senior pastors around here. So glad that you are actually part of Bayside Online. You really are part of our family. We have grown uh, over the last couple of years online a ton, and we really do consider you as part of our church family. So what that means is make sure you subscribe and share this, it's great. Uh, but also get in a community group, start watching the Bible study, start being engaged, even give. Uh, one of the ways that we can actually do online church and have this global community and even do the ministry of our campuses is by people partnering with us in the gospel, as Paul talks about in Philippians chapter one. And that means by your resources, financially, there are people all over the world getting blessed through what we do at Bayside. And so obviously part of that is giving and using and stewarding that for the glory of God. So we super thankful if you do that. We'd love you to start doing that and just super thankful you're part of our church. So glad you're with us. Make sure that you let us know you're watching and part of this because we want to get in touch with you and thank you and serve you any way we can. Anyway, thanks guys and we will see you next week.